that many years ago, I was on the Rhodes Scholar Selection Committee to Japan. Uh, then, after serving on that for a little bit of time, I stopped doing it. And when I finished, I went back to try to keep track of who we had picked and all the great ones over the years. And I noticed something very strange, which was that we had never picked for a Rhodes Scholar a person who had been interviewed right after lunch. We picked people who had been interviewed early in the morning, at the end of the day when we were tired, but right after lunch, evidently, everybody was feeling sleepy or comfortable or whatever, and never really came out. So, since then, I've made it a practice in the United States never to teach right after lunch. <laughs> at 8.30 in the morning, I teach at the end of the afternoon, but right after lunch, I don't teach. So, you people suffer from the fact that Pippin insisted on uh, having two things today, and then I have the one tomorrow morning, and so you'll have to bear with me after lunch. Now, uh, I talked this morning about how we change theory sometimes in a law economics thing by looking at the world as it is, by being lawyers, and seeing what the world is, and say, does theory explain it, and then try, when it doesn't, to change the theory. What I'm talking about today derives in a strange way from the opposite. This was a case in which I made a little model, a little economic theory model, which talked about ways in which entitlements, property ownership, was set up in the law. And this was the article on the cathedral, which is such a famous article. They say it's the most cited private law article uh, ever. It all depends on how you define private. Everything in law is always a matter of definition. Uh, but what that was, was a little model which said there are contract rules with the ownership on one side and the ownership on the other. There are regulation rules with the ownership on one side and the ownership on the other. And there are, if you look at the cases, liability rules with the ownership on one side. And when you did a model, the model said, what about liability or rules with the ownership on the other side? That is the reverse, the fourth rule, in which the person who owns the right can stop somebody from nuisancing him, but has to pay damages to that person, which didn't seem to exist in cases. Here, we did a little model which said, the theory says it should be there. The world doesn't seem to describe it. And here, what turned out was a rather interesting thing, that it was that we, as lawyers, were not looking at the whole world. We were looking only at the world of appellate decisions, which for certain reasons made it very unlikely, ultimately there was a case that came up, to have this fourth rule. But if you looked and said an administrative decision, eminent domain, and everything else, it turned out that this happened all the time. What I'm saying is that here it was theory making people look at the world differently and making the view of the world be more sophisticated, more realistic, more nuanced, because the theory pushed them to it. 
which I kind of like because my main thrust in law and economics is to say, yes, lawyer, institutionalist, look at the real world, push the theory. Here, you have theorists doing a model and showing us that the way you thought the world looked was only a bias, not in a negative sense, but in the sense of looked at only from one side view of the real world. And the theory asks you to reconsider that and maybe look at it differently. I mention all this in part because uh, there were three people who essentially at the same time saw this fourth rule, did the same thing that I did. I was one of them. The other was a student of mine who was then, I was teaching at Harvard that year, visiting Douglas Melamed, who wrote the article that I did, and the, um, who came up with it independently of me, which is why I made him a co-author, although I had had the same idea before. I didn't remember it, but Frank Michaelman showed me a letter I had written him uh, when he had written his review of the cost of accidents, in which he said, which the letter said, no, there are four rules rather than three. But there was also a third person, a guy named Rose, who wrote, nobody ever thought of him, but we found it relatively recently, a cousin of Susan Rose Ackerman, as it happens, just by chance, uh, who wrote a student note in Stanford about the same time, a little after, but clearly independently, also positing this thing. So I asked myself, what is it that these three people had in common that caused them to see things? You know, you always just, as a curiosity, in intellectual history, the only thing I could find that we had in common was that we had all studied economics at one time, very different times, over many different years, me much more me earlier than they, with a man named Ed Lindblom at Yale, who was an economist who said that economists should look at the world and change their theory the thing I was talking about this morning. That was what characterized Lindbergh. That wasn't what we did there. We looked at the theory and changed the world. And yet, the move of saying, in your discipline, you tend to do things in one way, look at it from a point of view of another discipline, and you may see more broadly, is not that difficult to move. So I've always thought that he was responsible for this. I saw him recently, he's nearly 100. And I told him of this and said, look, these three people. And the dear man started crying, which is nice. He was very happy. <laughs> OK, so that is the background of this odd thing. Uh, this led to this structure in which we talk about entitlements, whose property it is, and how it can be changed from me to you or from you to me. That is, of how I can sell my good, get rid of my bad, to you. And this immediately says something about the role of law. And let me just say something which I think is really quite important. It is often said that law is there to protect private property, that law protects what I have. That is true, that law protects private property, but actually law protects any arrangement of entitlement except one. There is only one entitlement that law does not need to enter into. And that entitlement is might makes right. I am stronger than you, and therefore it is mine. That doesn't need any law. 
Anything else, whether it is mine, it is yours, it is yours jointly, needs the law to protect it. There is nothing more prior about commonly owned property or privately owned property. They only exist insofar as the state, the law, protects them. Let me give you an example. I own cabbages, and I like cabbages. You come along, and you're bigger than I am, and you take my cabbages. That is the end of privately owned cabbages, unless I can use the law to make you give them back, or hang you, or do something so that you won't take my cabbages. That's what we think of as law protecting private property. But now, say that our legal arrangement, our arrangement is supposedly that cabbages are commonly owned. That everybody can pick cabbages where they want. And I go along with my little basket <laughs> to a common cabbage patch. And there I found this fellow, who is stronger than I am, who says, go away! <laughs> that is the end of communal cabbages. Unless I can have the law come in and say, stop it, he can pick his cabbages. The same is true of everything which we think we own. It's true of bodies, no less than cabbages. I own my body, supposedly, but somebody stronger than I am comes along and says, I'm going to break you. According to his or her sexual preference. I mean, <laughs> Unless I can invoke the law to keep that person from doing it, that is the end of my owning my body. And the same is true of communal ownership. Suppose we have a society in which we say everybody owns everybody else's body. I go to the communal body patch and look for a body I happen to like. I've been married 50 years to the same woman, so I wouldn't have I go there, and you are stronger than I am, and you say, get out of here. That is the end of communal bodies, unless I can invoke the law to protect my right to that. So, what I am saying is, the law protects the system of entitlements we, we have set up, whether they are commons, communal, or private, or semi-private, or what have you. And then the question is, how does the law allow us to shift that entitlement from me to you, or you to take it from me, without hanging, drawing, and quartering the person who comes. That's what this structure was. The original, or the first way, is by agreement among us. This is what I call property rules. And property rules, it's not really, it's contract. It says, I own this, or you own this, or this group owns this, but you are allowed to transfer it, to sell the good or get rid of the bad, to me, in exchange for something that you want, money. That is the most libertarian, liberale, way and is the rule of contract. The state sets the entitlement, whether individual or communal, and says it can only be shifted by agreement of the parties. And the state doesn't care anything else about it except 
to enforce the agreement. That is the most licit fair society we can have. Other than my case, right? Other than my case, right? The state must set the entitlement and protect it, but this allows a shift entirely according to the will of the parties. Now notice that while in the original article, the cathedral, I talk about this as being markets, money, contracts of that sort, I am now somewhat more sophisticated about this and say that the exchange does not necessarily need to take place through a money market. It can take place through an exchange of something else. It can be a market in time. It can be a market in other things. This is really what I was saying at the end of this morning's session, that there are markets that are not exactly pure money markets, but it still is a situation in which it is entirely the will of the parties. I give you my kidney. In exchange, I have two, you need one, for the agreement that you have that if ever I need another organ, you will give me that organ. Now, it can be an exchange in terms, or we can do it through a central exchange. If I give a kidney and somebody gets them, I have a right to get a kidney from a central exchange if I need it. The main thing is consent among the parties, agreeing on the price, and the way of exchange. This is the law of the libertarian laissez-faire society. Government is still needed to set the entitlement, but then the exchange is free. The reason I talk about these different things is because while people have with them a number of these, shown any number of sophisticated differences. They've never seen the different, we'll talk about the differences between pure markets and non-money markets and those, but there are as many here permutations on what is essentially the same. Okay, the other thing to say is that when I'm talking about these things, I'm not talking about things but things in context. That is, I may give you an entitlement to something which at some times can only be exchanged through a money market, but at other times the same thing can be exchanged in another way through torts, and in another way it can only be exchanged with government permission. That is, I'm not talking about whether my watch is mine and can only be exchanged in a libertarian way. Most of the time it can. But if you injure me in an automobile accident, you don't get hanged. You have to pay a certain price. And there may even be some time when the government says, sorry, you need the watch, give it to somebody else. Okay? So we're not talking about things that are subject to this entitlement as much as things in certain countries. Okay. The third way, entitlement, and I'm jumping the second because that's what I mainly want to focus on this afternoon, is uh, the entitlement is mine or yours or collected, and it can only be exchanged, transferred, moved from me to you, with permission of the government. That is, it is my body, but I cannot sell it to you. The government has to say it's okay. The government prohibits the sale. This is what I call inalienability. Things which are mine or yours, but the government not only says when they are mine, that they are mine or yours, but says how it is exchanged. I may have to go to a government body to get permission to take it from you. You may have to go from there. 
This happens all the time. Military service. It's my body, but the government drafts me and sends me off to die. There are any number of things in which the government sets the rules of when it is mine and when it can be exchanged. This is the area, if the first is the area of contract law, this is the area of criminal law and regulation. The government sets regulations which it enforces through criminal law. If you take it from me, without that we hang on, corner you, use the thumbs to do things which in a way you could say are a higher price, but actually what we are doing is say we want you to ask permission of the state and it will be the state who decides not only whose it is, mine privately, mine as a group, mine in common, yours, etc., but when this good or bad can be transferred. Now, in this area, somebody very good wrote uh, an article, Susan Rose Ackerman, saying that talking about inalienability in a simple way, as if the government decides, is itself too simple. Just as I said, you may have non-money markets or you may have markets. So what is the government that decides? Is it the central government that decides? Is it a jury or a little agency that decides? Is it a local draft board that decides or something else? It is regulation enforced by criminal law that you have any number of different, let's say, modified command structures that affect this transfer. And that can make an enormous difference because the distribution of power is very different if it's centralized and below. I'll give you an example. I'll come back to the sort of thing. When I wanted to go to study in England, after college, I was subject to the draft because of a Korean War. And whether I could go to study or not depended on a governmental decision. That is, whether my body was mine or not depended on a command decision. But it was not a centralized command decision with standards and things. There were some of those, but those I easily met. But then the decision was discretionary in the local board. So I went to local board 10 in New Haven, and I saw a woman, and I said, I would like to go study in England for two years. And that means being deferred for two years. And she said, well, two years is easy, because we won't be out of the Korean War in two years. Uh, and, uh, and you're young enough, so you'll still be eligible. And I said, but understand, that I'm going to come back and ask even more pressingly for three years more because then I'm going to want to go to law school. And after law school, I'm going to ask three years more because I want to do something else. I was being quite honest. So I want to be deferred because what I want to do is these things. Her name, in front of her, was Esposito, a fairly common Italian summer name there. She looked at that. She looked at my papers, she looked at my resume and she said, Calabresi. And I said, yes. She said, are these your grades, your work And I said, yes. And she said, you're Italian. And I said, yes. And you're smart. <laughs> she said, you'll have no problem with me. And so I was deferred. I, I would have been deferred forever. Actually, I almost got drafted into a Vietnam War because I was still eligible, but somehow that didn't happen. But at the time, that decision was a collective regulatory decision, but not made at a national level, but at a local level, where because of the chance of my name, I had more power or could have it come out my way. But nevertheless, totally different from a consensual one, it was entirely a matter of the state deciding whether it was mine or someone else's. Susan Rose Ackerman has pointed out 
that often with inalienability, our decisions are much more complicated than that. The state may say it is yours, and you may give it away, but you may not sell it. Interesting. You may give away your body, but you may not sell it. That is both your kidney or sexual. Or I may say, you may give it away, but only within the family. Or they may say, you may sell it, but you may not destroy it. We'll let you sell your body, but we won't let you kill yourself. Or we will let you sell this painting, which you own, but we won't let you destroy. That is, what is and is not subject to inalienability is itself a complicated governmental decision in how it works. So just as the pure market means not just pure money market, but many other forms, so inalienability is much more complicated. But in the end, just as the pure market has the government, the first contract, has the government come in and say, only it is yours, it is yours, it is yours, and here is, and then you can shift it as you wish by consent, and that's a most libertarian. So inalienability says, we decide whose it is, and we decide the circumstances in which it can be shifted. It is the most collective, the most collectivistic, the most command way of organizing the society. It is the state deciding what is mine, what is yours, all the way through, enforce these regulations by criminal law. In our legal system, if the first is the domain of contracts, this is the domain of criminal law and regulation. With these contrast the domain of what I call poets, but better called perhaps the liability rule. In this area, instead, what the decision is by the state is whether it is mine or whether it is yours, always at first thing. Do I have a right to pollute or to be free from pollution? Do I have a right to my kidney, or do you have a right to it because you need it, my fear, or whatever? The state makes that decision as it makes in all of these. But then, instead of either saying, and we decide the circumstances when it can be shifted, the most collectivist, or saying, and it's up to you entirely freely to decide when you shift it, the state says, you may shift it, but only if you pay a price which we set collectively. That is, it is like the first that it allows people to shift according to their desire to shift it, to get the good, get rid of the bad, and in that, it's very different from the third, which says, we tell you. But the shift is not by agreement of the parties, but when the parties agree to pay something, to do something that the state sets. You can drive and drive negligently and injure somebody and take somebody's body, and we don't hang you, we don't throw you in jail, but you have to pay a price which we set, which affects the price of driving. You may take somebody's property for a public use, but you must pay a price, eminent domain compensation, which we set. 
the state not only sets the decision of whose it is, but sets the terms on which it can be shifted, but the terms are not a collective decision. They are bent up to the individual consent of at least one of the parties. I am willing to pay what the state has said, and I am able to shift this to the other. In that way, it is both more state interfering than contract, libertarian, and more respectful understanding of individual desire than the collective. The collective says, you keep it, you have it, because we want it that way. This, instead, says, we tell you, because we have an interest collectively on where it is, but we allow your desire and intensity of desire, either to take this property or to drive or to do things that shift entitlements to be given weight and ultimately to shift the entitlement, but it is on our collective terms. So it's in the middle. It's in the middle between the purely private libertarian contract and the purely public criminal law. Now notice that the price set for the shift can vary enormously. It can be a price which would mimic the market if a market were feasible. We try to figure out what the market would charge, which is the way most Chicago people look at torts, that you should try Transaction costs are too high, so we cannot have a market. But we will set something which looks like the market. Or it can be something which says, we're not really interested in what you would do on the market, because we have an interest in keeping this entitlement where it is, and therefore allowing it only to be shifted if your intensity is enormous. So you pay three times, or a price which is actually three times of what the market would be. Or you pay punitive damages. You pay something which says, you may shift it, you don't go to jail. But the price is not the one that the market would set, because we collectively want a price that's different. Or we might say, we give it to you, but we want it to be shifted easily so that we actually allow you to take it for less than the market price. You don't think this exists? Well, in Italy, for a long time, you could take property for a public use and pay not the market value, but the value in use. So that if something was being used as farmland, it could be taken collectively for a very low price even though its market value for development would be very high. That was something that the collectivity wanted shifted. That is, the collectivity in setting the price, in setting the terms which the parties can then decide to act on, can go from market to disfavoring the exchange, to favoring the exchange, and there are any number also of ways in which it can set it up. It can do it. Anytime I want it, I can get it if I pay this, or only if there's a public purpose. Or you can do it, but you must pay regardless of fault, or you must do it only if there is fault. You know, there are any number of variants on this middle ground, just as there are variants on the first and on the third. But what they all have in common is the state setting the price and what it thinks is the appropriate way of having an exchange, and then I need to do it. Now, 
every legal system, I don't care how libertarian they are and how collectivistic they are, uses all three. There has never been a legal system that hasn't used all three. Why? Because any one of these, though it may, according to your theory or ideology, be the best way of shifting entitlements, is not going to be the best way after it tries to deal with the nth, the nth times nth problem. Maybe if we could decide everything collectively, we think we would do it best. But we can't decide every exchange of shoes, every shoelace, everything else that way, because we know it won't be done well. It overloads the system. And the same with your market. Maybe the pure market is in your way of doing things, the best way of shifting, but the pure market to be pure also needs not to be monopolistic, needs to be this, needs to be that, there needs to be information. It can't be done. And it is too expensive to negotiate it. So we say, you don't cross a red light, collective, enforced by criminal law, not you paying the price of crossing the red line. It's just too expensive to try to figure out the price of crossing. We know that most of the time it isn't worth it, so we permit it. And this is so of each of these. They become each overloaded. We cannot do everything through torts, no matter how much we would like to. We cannot do everything for regulation and criminal law. We cannot do everything for Congress. There are also some things we simply cannot do. I cannot, by contract, go out and negotiate with everybody who I might injure when I drive. I can't find you all. It's too expensive. So that way of shifting the entitlement of your body is safe, and my desire to drive can't be done in a pure market way, in the first way. And so the state says, we set a price. If you injure somebody when you're driving, we'll say, that's what this was worth. Whether that person likes it or not, but you have a right to do it and pay that and get away with it. Simply because we cannot have the market in the first place. So every society may have some of these. And does. The most collectivist society, say Russia at a certain point, had exchanges by contracts and had torts. 19th century, certainly had torts and had criminal law to some extent too. The interesting thing about modern society today is that we very often use the middle way, the liability rules, in situation where one of the others is perfectly feasible. In products liability, we could perfectly well say, no, when you buy a product, you negotiate with the seller. You're already buying it, so you negotiate with the seller of a price for an injury if a product turns out to be defective. In malpractice law, we could perfectly well say, you negotiate with your doctor on who pays if something goes wrong. We could perfectly well do that. And we could perfectly well also say, and there are some things which products cannot do. That is, we could regulate that to some extent and do the rest by contract and leave torts out altogether. The extraordinary thing is, and of course one might say, yes, but you can't leave it out altogether because that would be too much loading of the other. But we certainly could do an awful lot more through contracts and through criminal law and regulation than we in fact do. One of the interesting things 
about modern Western societies is the degree to which the liability rule is used in situations where it isn't essential to use it, where it is not necessary to use it, in situations where if we wanted to be more prepared, we could say, no, it's yours in contract only, or if we wanted to be more collectivistic, we would say, and we will decide at some level of who has it. We use it then where we don't need to, and I have to say then that we use it because we want to use it there for ideological reasons. Because ideologically, these societies are neither as libertarian as supposedly the 19th century was, or as collectivistic as supposedly the socialist countries are. These societies, to a degree that they may not recognize themselves, are social democratic. That is, they are societies which say, we want the collectivity to have more to say about the exchange, the shift of entitlement that occurs than in a libertarian society, but we want individual desire to transfer, to shift entitlement, to be more recognized, or in that extent, more individualistic than a collective society is able to do. Because the collective decision making finds it very difficult to see how much you want this and how much you want that. And that is characteristic of the West today that we use this middle way. Now, it would be interesting to study in each of these how much does the collectivity then decide and when different prices of exchange. When does it mimic the market? When does it try instead to say, yes, we really think it is yours and we don't want it to be shifted, but if you're willing to pay enough, we will let you do it. Punitive damages, extra contractual damages. When is it somewhere in between? That is, it would be interesting to see both the fact ideologically of the choice of a middle way and in different societies what the nature of that middle way is whether that middle way is more protective of entitlements and leaving them where they are, or more shifting of entitlements, or different in different parts. All of those are studies which are worth making and which have not been made. They look to making as sophisticated an examination of the middle way as Susan Rose Ackerman did of inalienability, and I suggested earlier could be made of contracts. Uh, but they still remain in all of those. Now notice also that all of these have important, important distributional consequences to the extent that the exchange is made entitlements on the basis of pure consent of the parties based on a market exchange and a money market exchange, that will mean that the exchange will occur according to the prevailing wealth distribution. If I have enough money, I will get your entitlement from you by paying you and I can do it because I'm rich enough. Now sometimes we collectively don't like that. That's what I'll be talking about tomorrow with Americans and Americans. But to the extent that we do that, if we do it market, the market wealth distribution,
function determines who gets what. If we have a pure draft, I'm sorry, a pure volunteer army system, you can be quite sure that Berlusconi does not go, or Guido Rossi, I don't care whether it's left or right, does not go into the military, but that the miserable Latte might. No, he's from Rich Hill. Okay. Very dramatic consequences from a distributional point of view. But the same is true of collectivity. Because power is not distributed equally either. We always think of wealth distribution as being unfairly distributed or not as equal which we want, and that's fair enough. True. But power is certainly also not distributed equally or fairly. And allocations according to power also have strong distributional consequences. The people who have power will say who gets drafted and who doesn't. Who goes and who doesn't. Which entitlement stays and which doesn't in a collective system. We all know that from looking at the socialist states, how often that was so. But we also know it from the most trivial example. The policeman, this is a classic American example, I don't know if it exists here, but the policeman who has no money, but goes by the fruit stand and takes an apple. And nobody says anything. Because he has power. And nobody's going to say anything about it. He may not have power as to other things, but as to that, power allocates the apple. So, we may not like the consequences of the power distribution, either of pure wealth or of pure power. I'm sorry, the distributional consequences, either of pure wealth or of pure power. And that may be a reason for using the middle ground. That is, we may cause the shifting to be done in some way that reflects a different distributional consequence. But even that has distributional consequence. Uh, we can change this by making the market not in money but in time. But time is not equally distributed either. You have much more time than I do because you're younger. My father once was standing in front of a post office thing, and the person in front was talking to the clerk, and talking and talking and talking. My father, who was very elderly and a doctor, tapped the person and said to the clerk, you look to me to be about 30, five, five. The clerk said, I'm 34, how did you know? My father said, I'm a doctor, and that's how I know. And then said, you are 34, and you have a lot of time. I am 83, and I don't have much time. Don't waste it! You know, time may be different from money. Everything has its own distribution. The price at which you allow a free exchange, the power at which you allow a power exchange, a collective or the intermediate way, each have their distributional consequences. But there's another consequence which is worth mentioning, and that is the way you choose does something about what you say about the entire the value in a moral sense that we give to the entire if we allow an exchange to pure money, I pay for your kidney, we commodify the kidney. We say to ourselves, this is something that can be bought or sold. And that's fine with respect to some things, but there are some things which we do not like to have commodified. That doesn't mean that we won't have them exchanged. That doesn't mean that we won't even have them exchanged taking money into account. 
but we want to say that life is a pearl beyond price. And we don't want to put a price on it. We want to say that our private parts are not for sale. And we don't want to put a clear price on it. So there is a cost, a negative, to a pure market also because it may commodify the matter to be exchanged. And that may affect why we do not choose to use a market. Now, what we don't want commodified is itself an ideological choice. But be careful, because the same thing occurs in what I've just, in preparing for this lecture, decided to call, and tomorrow's lecture, commandification. There is a price to commandifying certain things. We don't want to say too clearly your life is worth less than his life. Your life is worth more than his. That, for the state to say, is very costly, negative. If we don't want to put a price on the shifting of the entitlement, because we don't want to price the entitlement, so we may not want to make the shift be sufficiently clear that it makes the state in saying, you are worth less than she, or vice versa. And I will give you an example, which I may use again tomorrow, so excuse me, that's a rather dramatic example. During the Pentagon Papers case, the case involving whether certain information about the Vietnam War should be published, and the argument was whether you can ever have a prior restraint, an injunction before publication. Potter Stewart, graduate of my school, and a very smart man and a good friend, said to Alex Bickle, who was my colleague who was arguing the case, counsel, suppose it were the case that if we allowed publication, it were clear that a hundred young men and women would be killed, would not allowing publication amount to a judicial sentencing to death of these hundred young men and women? You know, your lives is not worth it. And Bickle started to argue about this, and then remembering he was not being an academic but a lawyer, said, Justice Stewart, that isn't this case. Don't worry about it. Worry about it only if it comes up. And that's what happened. Hugo Black, for whom I clerked, whose last opinion it was, he had been failing, but in that case, he got all excited about it, and wrote a wonderful Hugo Black opinion ending with foreign shot and shell, and the vintage Black, said to his clerk, who said to me, uh, clerk in union, Black said, Stuart asked the right question, but they gave the wrong answer. The question, wouldn't this amount to a judicial sentencing to death, is the right question. The cause was not that a hundred lives would be lost. We waste, in the parlance of the time, a hundred lives for all sorts of things that are far less important than freedom of speech and freedom of the press. What would be wrong was if this would be being done by the highest court of the land, judicially sentencing to death and saying at the highest level of commandification, your life is not worth it. And that is as costly as pricing lives. So what we have to do is hide things, do things, so that the lives are lost before the courts ever get into it. And the way to do it is by having an absolute rule, Black said, 
against prior restraint so that before ever you get to court, the 100 people are killed, it never gets to court. The hostages are killed before you have a chance to try to take the embassy and save them. Now, this is a way of saying that if pricing things is costly, so too clear command decision is costly. That may become a way, a reason for the middle rule. Because sometimes, sometimes a pseudo market can hide, and other times a pseudo command can hide, and other times you can hide best by having the middle way. How? Torts law is a good example. We want to compensate victims. And so we pay victims a certain amount. Isn't that nice? We want to compensate victims, so we pay victims a certain amount. We happen to do it in a way that makes the price of victim-creating goods, of dangerous goods, more expensive. Pricing, heaven forbid, if anybody came and told us, oh, I did it because the price was right and I can take somebody, we slap them with punitive damage. That's what happened in the Fort Pinto case. Not a bit of it. You can't say it's worth burning babies. It isn't. But the way the system works is, in fact, to introduce a price without introducing a price. And so it is with some elements of commandification. So this middle way has an ideological basis because we want the state to be involved, but also an ideological basis because we want to affect distribution, and also an ideological basis because we want sometimes not to not commodify or commandify for ideological reasons against commodifying or commandifying, and the middle way allows us a way, a subterfuge, a way of hiding what we are doing while achieving what we do. So it is a middle way ideologically in a very complex way. There are many reasons why people might be social democratic in this sense, some of which are very easy social democratic things to do with wealth distribution, to do with involvement of productivity. Others are more complicated. I don't know what makes Western societies on the whole social democratic. I don't know whether we will stay this way. There has been an interesting move in the last few years in the United States more towards the market and regulation. Or pseudo-regulation, but regulation still. For instance, with preemption of cases in drug production cases. As if they, some people say, we will tolerate a degree of libertarianism and a degree of collectivism, but we don't want this dangerous middle way because it may be more dangerous it may make us less libertarian than something which says we are libertarian and every once in a while we need to be collectivistic. And there's nothing new about that. If any of you ever have a chance to read the decision of old Judge Werner striking down workers' compensation in New York in 1910, the decision is one which is full of the market, the market, the market, and by the way, regulation is okay too. The market, the market, the market, and by the way, regulation is okay too. The one thing I don't want is liabilities. Now, ideologically, you may go to one extreme or the other and leave the middle out. Nevertheless, despite this little mini trend in the United States today, we are still hugely the law of a mixed society. And how and where is something which is well worth examining. I don't know 
how much we have become conscious of this. My late colleague, Leon Lipson, who was probably the most brilliant person on the law faculty, he never wrote. He was too brilliant to write, because when he talked, he could be perfection. And I think he feared that if he ever wrote anything, it would not be perfect, and that would be beneath him. Great tragedy. He was also extremely articulate. Uh, I guess he became that articulate uh, because of his, his father. Uh, he once gave a commencement speech in which he gave the whole 20 minute speech in words of one syllable. Can you imagine that? I won't. Words of one syllable. Beautiful speech. And as he became this uh, particular thing, his, his father, uh, he had heard. Uh, his father was very articulate to it. He had heard that there were three words in English which one could not describe without using your hands. And one was goatee, and the other was spiral staircase, and I don't remember what the first one was. <laughs> and so Lipson asked his father, Father, what is a spiral staircase? To see if his father did. And his father went. <laughs> he knew it. So, Lipson, who was an expert on Soviet socialist, but who also taught contract, said to me when I was doing this thing first, he said, in the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, all the major legal philosophers in the West came out of contract. Their field of law was contract law. And from that, they went to legal philosophy. At the same time, they after, all the major legal philosophers in the socialist states came out of criminal law. And then went into philosophy. That isn't surprising if you think of that as the paradigm of what that should be. And then he said, I wonder whether in the next century the legal philosophers in Western countries will come out of liability rule areas. Torts, like James Coleman, uh, eminent domain, takings, and things of that sort. I don't know. That would be an interesting outlier sign that we are even at the philosophical level more ideologically mixed than many want. The advantages for doing things, this is what Hugo this morning suggested, for doing things which take into account individual desire in a way that a purely collective system cannot do. And yet, introduce collective values in the way that a pure market cannot do, are certainly there. The question is, is this what you want? Are you ideologically mixed? Thank you. So there's a little bit of time for a question, but if you, you know, if you're tired, and uh, we can, uh, if we have some time, and if you have questions about this or about anything else that I've been talking about, or anything that I haven't been talking about, because after all, uh, you know, I've been talking as a scholar, and I am that. I am primarily a teacher and a scholar, but. I was for nine years a dean for my sins, and rather enjoyed it. One enjoys one sins. And, uh, and I have been for 17 years now a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals. So I'm also very much a judge. It's the equivalent of Cassazione, essentially, in what it does. Very few of our cases go up to the Supreme Court for the Second Circuit, and they're all small, I mean, certain constitutional issues which we know about. Uh, so that anything that you might want to ask about judging, 
and things, uh, I'd be happy to answer, including some strange thing. I mean, what does a judge do when the law is wrong? <laughs> Immoral. What does a judge do in that situation? So it's up to you. And I will come and answer questions. If you notice this morning, when you asked questions, I went up to you. That's because I'm hard of hearing. And when I teach towards, uh, I have a big class, one of the large classes in you know, uh, and about 80 people or something like that, one of the largest classes in the school. And I always ask questions, because I teach in a question-asking way, but I always then go and ask a question right up to somebody. And at first they think I'm just being nice and polite. And it's, isn't he nice and friendly? And only after a couple of weeks, after they're completely full, I tell them it's just like that. <laughs> I mean, like you were saying that what does the judge do when uh, there's a law which is immoral, but it is already written there? I'm sorry. When you have a written type, written constitution, the, the law which is written there, and, and the courts, they have uh, not that much liberty to, to, to apply the law, and you were just saying that what the judge should do when the law is wrong. Well, let me say that uh, I am. First, a believer in a written constitution. Uh, I am a believer in a written constitution because one of the characteristics of human beings which helps us to adapt, which helps us to survive, is how adaptable we are. We accept things which before we did not think were acceptable. And so something that if day one seems horrible, over time, through a series of cases, the slippery slope of growing horribles starts to become OK. Sometimes for the good, because values change, sometimes for the bad. And we adapt remarkably. If somebody had asked a good German in 1933 whether the first laws against Jews would lead to the gas chambers in just 10 years, they would have said you were crazy. In Canada, but we adapt. Values change as a result of law. Brown versus Board of Education changed values enormously. The abortion decision, the same in different ways. A written constitution allows a judge to say, yes, while the law says no one should be tried twice for the same offense, this case said it wasn't double jeopardy. And the next case it looked like it said it wasn't double jeopardy. And the next case said it wasn't. And the next case said it wasn't. And the next case said it wasn't. And here is where we are now. But the law says no one shall be twice put in jeopardy. And so it allows you to ratchet yourself up. This was the belief of Hugo Black, and I share that to a large extent. Now, it also happens to be that Nino Scalia says some of those things. The way he says it and he uses it, I think, is wrong. And if I now I'm explain why I think what he does in that is wrong, well, there is some truth to this. But the fact is that judges at any given time are affected, constrained by the written constitution, by what laws say, and also by precedents. As to the written constitution, again, I can say this can be good or it can be bad. I know for a fact that when Brown versus Board of Education was being written, 
Justice Reed, who was from Kentucky, and a bigot, totally a southern bigot, did not want to join that. And Hugo Black went to see him and said, here is what the Constitution says. Here is this, that, and the other. Here is why, under the law, you must go along. Black wanted very much to have a unanimous opinion. And he wanted the law to compel Reed to vote against his bigotry. Reed did. But he was enough of a bigotry excuse me for saying so, saying this, that he said, this has been published, but I learned it first from Black, but he said to Black, I'll vote with you, but I sure hope it doesn't mean Mrs. Reed has to sit next to a Negro. He was that much of a Negro. But the law compelled him. Okay? Good thing. There are some times that the law does not look so good. It is particularly bad or difficult for a judge on my court because my court is probably the most law-constrained court of any. The Supreme Court sets the parameters which we must follow in how it will put our purpose for the Constitution and we have to follow the Constitution as the Supreme Court has interpreted. We have to. The trial court finds the facts, and finding the facts all often gives a certain amount of room. But what is more, we are bound to follow the decision of any other panel of our court. So if you three judges decide a month ago, A, and I have the same case a month later, I have to say A, even though I would like to say B, because I am bound by your decision, even though I think it's wrong. The only way I can overcome that is if I can convince our court to sit in bank, the whole court, every member of the court, then they can reverse the decision of a free judge panel. But for certain reasons, my court very rarely goes in bank. So almost all of the time, if you say A, hey, I have to follow it, even if I think it is wrong. So where does that lead me? Well, let me say that being a judge is interesting because every once in a while you get to write the great opinion which gets cited in the case books, or complained about by law professors, or you somebody who really likes said that was Calabresi at his best. And you feel good about that, because I don't care how old you are, you always like memory patches. Uh, but that, while it's fun, you can also do by writing articles. No, no, not quite the same way, but you could. It's fun being a judge for that. Then there are all the cases that are easy. But the law is easy, it's clear, you write it, you try to write it elegantly, and some of my colleagues say that must be boring, and the answer is no, it's not boring, because what you do with an easy case, if you have any intellectual interest, is write the opinion simply, but in your mind, change a few facts, and make it into a really hard case, and say, what would I do if it were that? And intellectually, that's great fun, and it also prepares you for a case which is hard, which will come up later. We're generalists. I'm an expert on constitutional, fiscal, bankruptcy, pensions, criminal, everything. How can I be that? Because most of the cases are easy, and I start thinking about all the tough ones. So that's kind of fun, but that isn't what being a judge is really about. But being a judge, what makes being a judge for me worthwhile is what do you do when the law seems wrong and you are bound by it. But you're bound by it and I am bound by my own. 
And I will follow my oath, in part because I think that when I took an oath, I will do it. In part because I don't trust my siblings, my other judges, to do what they think is right. I would rather that they follow the law. I trust the law more than I trust them. And if I don't follow the law, how can I expect them to? But if I do, I can expect them. So I will follow the law. And I will follow the law even if it makes me make a decision which I find unacceptable and even immoral. I have not yet had a case in which I have had to approve a death sentence. I can't stand the idea of doing it. I think capital punishment is an abomination. But it may happen. But what do I do? When I have a case where I think the law is wrong, I wake up in the middle of the night and I examine, using all the gifts God gave me, whether the law is really that way or people have misunderstood it. And when I say I wake up in the middle of the night, I will do that. But I also mean I will start looking at a case which is headed my way where everybody says the law requires this. And I think that is deeply wrong to look for mistakes. So in one capital case, I followed it from its beginning and I was ready to demonstrate that something no one else had seen was an error here. The jury found life imprisonment rather than capital punishment, so the issue disappeared. But I was ready. And when you do that, several things can happen. Sometimes, when you look and look and look, you convince yourself that actually the law was right and your moral instinct was wrong which even as modest a fellow as I have to admit occasionally is the case. You know, the law does represent exploitation and things like that, but it does also represent the wisdom, experience of the human race. So sometimes you get into it and you say, no, gee, you know, I understand now why the law does that. And other times, and this is what makes being a judge worthwhile, you find that the law does not really require. That people had misunderstood because they cited something which looked like the same thing, but it was actually different, and this case can be distinguished, and it can come out this way rather than that. And then you go in to your colleagues the next day, and you say, you know, everybody says that the law is A, and we're bound by it, but it isn't, because this and this and this and this. And then, if you're on a court, which is not ideological, and by and large, ours is not too bad, the other judges, or at least one of them, will say, you know, you're right, that's wonderful. This case bothered me, and I'm glad to come out that way. It bothered him or her, but not as much as it bothered me, or he or she would have woken up in the middle of the night and done that. And sometimes it will be that judge who cares enough to work harder and come out with that. And when you come out with something which is right in the law and right in terms of justice, that next night you sleep very well. And that is what makes being a judge more than the other things worthwhile. The times you've been able to do that using whatever gifts can be. There will be times when you do not find anything and you have to follow the law that you think is wrong. Some of these times you will write a separate concurring opinion 
saying, this is the law and I must follow it. But it is wrong for these reasons. I'm bound to follow the law. The Supreme Court has said this. But it is wrong. I have to follow it. So I vote that way. But it is wrong. If you do that too often, your fellow judges will think you are paying the money. You know, they're thinking really terrible. So you can only do that in really important cases. But sometimes you can write for history and say it is wrong, but in the end, people will recognize that this law is wrong and change. That is very tempting because it makes you feel good. Everybody else is wrong. I had to follow it because I had no, but here is the truth, the goodness, and the light. And it's important to do. The danger of it is that it tempts you to do it too soon and not work hard enough to see whether that is really what the law requires. It's such fun to write the great thing. T.S. Eliot, a man of all whom I don't like, uh, wrote uh, personally, but he was a great poet, in Murder of the Cathedral, The Temptation to Martyrdom. The Temptation to be a Martyr. And I say this is the same thing, the temptation to be a martyr, and to say how nice I am, I have to follow, and this is wrong. It's a particularly easy temptation, because you're a martyr, but the person who gets hanged or goes to jail is somebody else. And you're affirming the thing, and you're right. And you want to be very careful not to do it too easily. But there are times when that is so. I may do this now in a case which involves uh, financing of um, campaigns, political campaigns, where I think the Supreme Court is completely wrong has misunderstood everything, and I have a case in which we have to follow what the Supreme Court has done in certain ways and not in others, and if it is appropriate, I may write a concurring opinion saying, yes, of course, this is what we do, but it's all nonsense. So I may do that, and I say, that makes you feel good, but there are the times when you can. The one thing you cannot do, if you reach a result which is unjust, from your point of view, but which you feel the law requires you to do, is to ask the person who goes to jail or suffers the consequences of your applying that law to forgive you. You can't do that. That is putting a burden on the person who is already suffering because you're following the law that you may not do. And I have an example which involves some filthy language, but there it is. Lewis Pollock, who is a great district judge, who taught me constitutional law, is a judge in Pennsylvania, and a wonderful human being. When he first went out of the bench, he tells his story on himself, sentenced somebody to a sentence which was way too high, he thought, unjust, but which he had no choice but to impose. And being a nice man, he then got off the bench and went to the person whom he was sentencing and put his arm around him and said, I can't tell you how sorry I am that I had to do this. And the person looked at him and said, fuck you. Which <laughs> <laughs> was exactly the right thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take it. What are you there telling me if you're sorry? You want me to tell you it's all right? Yeah. Go home and have some ice cream while I go to jail. <laughs> and Lou showed me in that. And at that point, it's between you and your God. And you ask yourself, have I really done the best I could? Have I worked as hard as I could? But the moments when you find the way and sleep well, that's the difference between the pleasures of writing and teaching and, 
and the pleasure of writing of being a judge. Because at that time, you know that because you woke up in the middle of a riot, justice was done. That's what keeps me doing that. You know, at 78, I love to teach. I can't do without it. I never stop teaching. And now I'm senior enough so I can judge as much or as little as I want. And I have books to write. And I don't have much time left. Because while my mind is still there, I don't go back to its flesh. And in this physical capacity to do it, and I know that in a few years my mind will go. Or I will go. So I want to do those, and yet I want to keep judging because there remain those times when I can come home and feel that because I was there, it made a difference. A long answer to your question, but it's a deep one. What is your name? I've been my using you as an example. Yes, that's fine. Uh, my name is Nick. Uh, I'm sorry? Nick Robinson. Nick, Nick Robinson, where are you from? I'm actually from the States. I, I went to Yale. Um, you went to Yale? Yeah. Yale also? Yeah. And I didn't know you? No, no, no. You avoided me all those years? I asked you, <laughs> you once or twice outside the law school. But, uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad I used you as my example. No, no, no. <laughs> and, um, uh, but I'm here as a, as a visiting researcher right now. Um, the, my question had to do with the, the cathedral article, and I have to apologize because I haven't read that article since I took Ellison's reports um, many years ago. Um, and I was wondering. Ellison was my student in, uh, in the state of gift tax. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and I, I guess my question is is the, 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 the cathedral um, is supposed to be a complete. Mm, uh, uh, diagram of everything that can happen, of, of the different options. So you lay out, you know, you have these hard and fast kind of criminal rules that you know, the state puts forward, or you have tort rules, or you have contract rules. But it strikes me, at least in theory, and I can think even in practice, there might be other paradigms. So the thing that struck me when you were talking was something which isn't as common in the West, but I've been spending a lot of time in India and Pakistan. And that area, in Pakistan, they have blood money. Right? So it's an option in criminal law. Right? It's almost like private criminal law at one level. And it makes you wonder if, if the model, I don't know, I, since I haven't read the article for a while, it's been, uh, no. yeah, no. Uh, let me say then that first, uh, I thought of the cathedral article as being the most simplistic of any of the articles that I wrote. I wrote it because I was visiting in Harvard, and they wanted an article. And so I put this little thing, and I had this tool, and I wrote it. And I thought it was very simple-minded. I still think it's simple-minded. And in many ways, the reason it has been cited so much is precisely because it is so simple-minded that many people find different things to say about it. Some of my things, which I think are deeper and have more but on the other hand this and on the other hand that and on the other hand the other, being more complicated and less room for people to move. And these categories are overly simple in the way that I've been trying even to say today. In addition, it is called one view of the cathedral. And it refers to Monet's paintings of a cathedral in Rome, in which he did a zillion paintings of the cathedral, and you cannot understand the cathedral without looking at all of his paintings. The cathedral is law, and this is one view of that cathedral. So that the article in its title says, hey, this is only one view. And it is a view that comes from law and economics and structures the thing in terms of these simplistic rules from the standpoint of law and economics. Somebody looking at it from another point of view, law and psychodynamics, will say, no, completely different sets of characters. 
So in that sense, but even within these, whether the different categories are actually impermeable or whether some things that a legal system calls criminal law or calls contract are actually something else is something that needs to be examined. So when you tell me that a system has a blood money component, I will ask whether, regardless of whether they call it criminal law, whether this is really contract, that the price is set between the parties, or torts, that the state sets the price for the blood money, in which case you can pay the blood money and get out of it. And I don't call it care if you call it Thucydides or if you call it mustard plaster. It still is the liability approval. Yeah, but isn't it the option of bring, because you can either accept money or the person can go to jail. So in some ways you're, pri you're creating a private right. criminal law, right? But that is always the case where you have a liability rule. If you don't pay, we enforce the liability rule by going to jail. So that is always the case. We always enforce the liability rule by the law. We enforce each of these by law. If you really won't pay your contracts, things, you go to debtor's prison. We always, that is again, the law enforcing the original entitlement. So I'm not saying that that is an adequate explanation of blood money. It may be that the explanation of blood money is better given to anthropology or to something that doesn't use this economic view of the cathedral. But even if it does, what I want to say is do not be so sure that when we say something is criminal, we are really saying that. And that exists easily in the United States. A parking ticket is a criminal violation. It's not a criminal violation. It's a liability rule. If I pay that amount, I can park illegally. I always park illegally. <laughs> I always park illegally. And I think I do a civil service. I never park illegally in a handicapped space. I never park illegally next to a fire hydrant. I never park illegally in a place where it would be dangerous. But there are any number of illegal spaces that are absurd. They are made illegal because once the one-way streets ran in a particular way, and so it was dangerous to park there, they changed the one-way street, but they haven't changed that. I park illegally because I can afford to pay the ticket. And by doing that, I leave a legal parking space for you who can. <laughs> so just don't tell me that that's criminal law, because that's not what we're about. You know, so that verbally, we may call some of these things. But where, again, what you are doing fits, uh, by the way, Alexa now wants, makes people in his property course uh, read uh, the cathedral, so I guess. Uh, one other thing about Alexa, and this only somebody from uh, Yale and knowing the United States would know, Alexa is one of the most conservative people scholars ever. Brilliant teacher, wonderful person in many ways, very conservative. He is a cousin of a very important judge. And when I ask whose cousin he is, people can't think. It turns out that he is a cousin of Louis H. Pollock. His mother and Lou Pollock were first cousins. And if you look at his head, it's very like Lou Pollock's. How it happened that these two went in such different directions, I don't know. But when people ask me about my very, 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 very conservative nephew, 
who started the Federalist Society and so on. He's a good kid, but he's a right slave. Uh, is, uh, uh, I and my father asked how it could happen. I said to him, it happens in the best of families. <laughs> Questions? Good. It's almost four o'clock. Thank you very much, and I'll see you.